We rejoice that you are here and that we can worship the Lord together. All right, well, welcome, and I invite us to stand as we are able for our call to worship this morning from Matthew 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you, you will find. find. Knock, and the door will be opened. We come today asking questions, seeking God's truth, and longing for God's presence to be with us. The one who puts Jesus' words into practice is like a wise builder who chooses the solid rock for the foundation of the house to be built. My life built on the solid foundation of Jesus will not easily fall because he is faithful. We seek Jesus this morning as we worship and praise.
Father God, we just thank you so much for this time that we can praise your name and to give you glory for who you are. And Lord, I just pray that we would never forget that we are your chosen people, that you have called us into this life of fellowship with you and that we can live in that power and in your spirit each day. Lord, we just praise you and we continue to give you glory. Amen. Before the throne children to come up for their message. Good morning, everyone. Hello. How is, how is everyone today? I need, I need your help. Can you, can you hold this? Okay. And then I have one more thing. We have a very special message today because we have something really special happening. Do you smell something? Have you smelled something all morning? Bread. Have you, can you all smell the bread? Did you know it's communion day? Once a month here, we do communion. And I thought it'd be really cool to do a little lesson on it. So what happens when you have a birthday? You celebrate it. And sometimes you get a cupcake or a cake and you put something on top of it and you go, Phew. you put a candle. And every year we celebrate with a birthday cake or a candle. 
really cool candle, or I mean, oh yeah, cool candle too. Those ones that don't ever go out. Have you ever had those? And you go, oh my goodness. Have, what, have you ever had a really, really special cake you can remember that looked really fun? Oh, your cousin had a color-changing candle. That's cool. Yeah. Well, we just celebrated David's birthday on May 2nd, and so we got a really, really yummy chocolate cake. Do you like chocolate? Who doesn't like chocolate? Some people don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Well, you know, every birthday we celebrate it once a year, and sometimes every Sunday, churches celebrate Jesus by taking communion. They have the bread or crackers and the wine or grape juice. But here we celebrate once a month, and it's today. If you look over there, there's bread that's baked, and it smells so yummy. Can you, can you breathe in with me and smell it? And you know what? When Jesus was here before he went and died on the cross and then rose again, he took the bread. He was sitting at the table with his friends. Can you grab that bread for me? And I, we brought some sandwich bread today because I thought it'd be kind of cool to see every day we eat. And Jesus wants us to remember him as we eat, especially during communion. Can you say communion? Okay. Have you ever had communion before? Yet? Yeah? Okay. And you probably are familiar with this, but it says in the Bible that Jesus took the bread. Can you take take the bread? So you're doing something physical with your hand. Shows, yeah, you can rip off a piece too and share it. Let's give one to the kiddos. Take, take the bread. Jesus took the bread. Josh, you want to take the bread too? It's okay. Mom <laughs> took the bread and broke it. And you know what? He blessed he blessed it. So he prayed and he said, God, Father in heaven, we ask that you bless this bread. And he said this to his friends so that every single time they ate the bread and they drank the grape juice, they would remember Jesus and the love that he has for them. Jesus gave himself for us. And he took the grape juice and he shared and he said, this is my body given for you. And he said, I want you to remember how much I love you every single time you do this. And we're going to do a really fun craft um, where the bread moves up to the wine and you can dip it in. Um, but we just want to say thank you to God for giving us Jesus and the bread and the grape juice. Can you pray with me and say, you can repeat after me. Say, dear God, thank you for giving Jesus Help us remember his love every day. And every time we take communion. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Thank you for learning with me. You can eat it. And we are going to join today in service. All the kids are going to come back, and we're going to see how Pastor Dave leads us and, and all the people to remember that Jesus loves all of us. Okay, so let's go back and do a little bit more of a lesson, and then we'll join you guys later for our first communion here. Okay, could you grab, could you grab this? Thank you. Okay. Well, good morning, all. That was a, a lovely lesson um, about communion. Wow, wasn't that rain fun yesterday? <laughs> We drove all the way out to Eastern or uh, Lodi area looking at some property and great time to take pictures because everything is sparkling and green. Wait a couple of months and it'll all be brown, but it sure was beautiful yesterday. So good morning and welcome to Union Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning and here are a few announcements for the week. In the pews are the connection cards, which we encourage everyone to fill out and drop in the offering plate. It's a great way to let us know um, you are here and how we may help you get connected to the various ministries in our church. You may also submit prayer requests or requests to be added to the weekly email or connect with us online by visiting unionpc.org and click on the Connect With Us image. Christmas is coming in 234 days. 
But in anticipation, we are wrapping, wrapping shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child and could use your help. The next wrap session is tomorrow, Monday, May 6, from 4 to 6 p.m. in the conference room. We'll supply everything you need. It's so okay to come late or leave early. We just hope to see you. And is Jean here today? I don't see her. Um, but if you have questions, get in touch with Jean. The Alpha program is set to begin on Tuesday, May 7th at 7 p.m. at Pastor Dave's home. The Alpha course is a series of videos and program designed to explore the Christian faith with other, others. It's a low pressure environment to discuss the big questions in life about Christianity. For more information, contact Pastor Dave. You're invited to the next Hallelujah Christmas uh, Children's Choir presentation next Sunday, May 12th at 10 a.m., which, by the way, is Mother's Day, if anybody's forgetting that. Bring your family and friends, and you won't want to miss this special day. I'm certain all of you have heard that um, our friend and union member, Jerry Ivey, passed away and was called home to be with the Lord. His memorial service will be set on Saturday, May 18th at 1 p.m. here at Union Church with a reception following at the Los Altos Country Club. And the request is not to wear jeans that day, please. For more details, see the invitation in the weekly email. So please keep Jerry's family, especially our friend Debbie, in your prayers as they mourn his loss and plan for his celebration of life. It is a new month, so we have a new Bible memory verse. For those who are interested, there are small cards in the lobby with the Bible memory verse printed on it. You're welcome to take one with you and practice memorizing it for the month and take another one to share with a neighbor or a friend. Please join me as we say aloud the Bible memory verse for May, which is Hebrews 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As part of our worship, we continue to give back to God out of the blessings he has given us. During the offering music, we invite the ushers to come forward to pass the plates to collect the offering and the connection cards. Other ways to give include mailing your check to the church, or you may give online at unionpc.org slash give.
Mag there we go. Okay. That was just a test to see if you were paying attention. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Poor James is in the back waving his hands trying to get my attention. Gosh. Uh, so our Old Testament reading is Psalm 32, verses 1 to 11. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. And then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let, anyone, uh, let everyone who is godly pray to you while you may be found. Surely the mighty waters rise, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. And do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. At Fuller Seminary, we had three distinct schools. One was the school that I was in, the School of Theology. So it was training up pastors um, and, and people who were going to go into, go off and get their PhD and go into teaching. Um, there was the, the School of World Missions that trained missionaries. And um, there was the School of Christian Counseling. Um, and the counselors, it must be said, painfully, uh, they were the best basketball players. Um, and of the three groups, they probably at this point have the highest annual salary. Um, it goes without saying that the, the pastor's group were the smartest and the best looking. Um, and boy, those, those poor missionaries. Anyway, <clears throat> there's a word for today's passage that's probably the closest word we have in the Bible to the idea of counseling, and I'll get to that in a minute. You, you remember what I've been saying through this time in the book of Hebrews, that we're, the book of Hebrews is written to urban Hebrews, uh, Christians who were actually struggling. Life was not easy as a Christian in those early days. Converts were often ostracized and avoided, shunned by their family members, members of the community, and, and former patrons of their business. You can imagine if you were a cobbler making people's shoes, that if everybody that you knew, all your family, your, your patrons, or your business, nobody wants to do business with you anymore, suddenly life gets really hard really quickly. And this is really what I think in some ways Hebrews is trying to address. If being a Christian is so great, if this is what God wants for me and for us, why is life so hard? Why is life so hard following Jesus? And my assumption is that following a Christian, has, following Christ has never been easy, um, but if we're to pursue the truth, it becomes necessary. So in all this, the author wants the Hebrews to know that with God, with Christ, they have someone they can talk to, someone who's been through this hard life and done it well on their behalf. So we've got two sections in Hebrews today, a couple verses, verses 12 and 13 in chapter 3, and then jumping to 4, 14 through 5, 7. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Therefore, jumping down to 14, therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess, profess. <clears throat> For if we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every priest is selected from among, among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. 
he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And, and he says in another place, you are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and it's not just your word to those people back then, but it's your word to us today, where we are. So I ask, Lord, that you would uh, open our ears um, to hear it, um, open our hearts to, to put it in there and, and to live on it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the word that I was talking about, that's counseling word, is a word called parakaleo. And, and what it means is, is to address or comfort or exhort. Para means alongside with and kaleo, which means to call. So to call alongside or in context, probably counseling is the best definition. Now, in the Holy Spirit in Greek is called the paraclete. Um, and so you can hear the, the, the word similarities, paraclete and parakaleo. So and that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is counseling. So what kind of counseling do we need? Um, why do we need it? Who's to give it? And how do we receive it? And so that's what I want us to think about today. So I want to back up just a second, and you'll re recognize this passage from last week, uh, but it kind of leads into where we're talking about. So let me back up just a second. He says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the testing in the wilderness. This is where the Lord swore in his wrath, they will never enter my rest. Remember, we talked about that last week, the importance of rest. And he says, take care, care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from God. Counsel one another daily so that you may not be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Um, so, like I said last week, this was referring to a time in the desert um, where the Israelites had left Egypt behind in this slavery and were going towards the promised land. Um, but the desert is a hard place, right? You all have been to the desert. You see it. You know about it. In the actual desert's not a metaphor for them. This is very little rain. There's not much to eat. There's not much for the animals to eat. And the people get hungry and thirsty and tired. I mean, they said, at least in Egypt, we had food and water, and you've dragged us out here in the middle of nowhere for nothing. What's going on? Life is just so much tougher. <clears throat> they were frustrated and angry that they had risked their lives, risked everything, and now it all seemed worse. In Exodus 17, the people start fighting with Moses. The author of Hebrews is reminding his people of their past, that God was faithful don't be like they were, he says. Don't be like the people who gave up on God in the wilderness. And I think what the, the author is, is saying to us is that he understands that life is tough out there. And life can seem to be like a desert. Sometimes in the desert, the things that, that, that give us life can be few and far between. And when we depend on success in business or, or money or friendships to make us happy and fulfilled, to give us life, the problem is those things are not going to give us life. Don't get me wrong. Professional success is great. Family is great. Friends are great. But they will never give our lives meaning or purpose. They can't. They cannot satisfy us. God created us to, be con to find contentedness and satisfaction in Him rather than in the things of this temporary life. Here's the other thing I think the author is, is hinting at. That, that life really is a wilderness. And, and when he's talking about that, he's talking about with God too. You remember in Egypt, God was doing all kinds of amazing miracles, right? There were the 10 plagues. Moses had this stick. If he threw it on the ground, it turned into a snake. And if he picked it up, it turned back into a staff. That was amazing. And then when they get into the promised land, 
They, they march around Jericho seven times and the walls just fall over, right? There's a, God's doing a lot of good things on either end, but in the middle, in the wilderness, the only thing I can think of, you know, they, they didn't see you know, Moses get everything, so they just saw the, the, cl- the cloud on, on top of the mountain and then Moses comes down with stuff. It just seems like God's a little bit less present. There's the pillar of fire during the night, and maybe, maybe not uh, going every night. I don't know. There's the clouds during the day. It just seems like God was a little bit less present than he had been in Egypt and getting them out, and then in the promised land when they, when they come in. In the wilderness, it may seem like God doesn't care or that he's forgotten about us, and, and the things that he could write seem to be going wrong. I think the passage is saying is there's a lot of times in our lives, maybe most of the time of our lives, will be spent in what feels like a desert. So we're going to be in a place where we're going to be unsatisfied by the best things and we likely won't find God doing all the things that we'd really like him to do in the timing that we would really appreciate. And so then we will experience the hardness of life. And so we need counseling, encouragement. Otherwise, says we're going to get hard. Our hearts will harden, and that's what we don't want. The temptation will to, be, to become cynical, to stop trusting God and to stop daring to hope. And the worst is when we start to, to kill off those parts of us that are still hoping. The only, and the only possible way to avoid this chasm of misery is constant daily counseling. But what sort? Hebrews seems to go back and forth on, on the carrot or the, or the whip, how to treat the, the readers. On one hand, there's this strict, listen, straighten up, fly right. End of chapter 3, he says, don't, don't turn, don't disbelieve, be careful, have a sin, don't have a sinful heart. Don't be like those Israelites whose bodies we had to leave in the desert because they weren't faithful to God. Then in verse 16, he says, it's all about grace. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Repeatedly, the, the, the readers are alternatively warned and then invited uh, to experience grace and love. I mean, it's funny how people need to hear different things, um, are encouraged, they find their strength through different approaches. You know, when I was playing football, we had coaches that, that the best coaches knew how to do this well, that somebody would come off the field and say, ah, oh, my, my side, my hip is really hurting. And some of the coaches, knowing the kids, they'd say, listen, rub some dirt in it and get back in there, right? Suck it up. And the other times they'd say, okay, go take a breath, sit out, you know, sit out a couple plays, take, get some water, we'll get you back in there. I, um, I was hoping Lauren was here today. So, um, he's not, so I, I can safely tell this story, that, that there are just different people on the football team, and there's different mentalities. Um, I played offensive line, and offensive line, you have a job to do. You're out, you're, your job is to block that one person or to prevent that, that whoever's coming around from getting to the quarterback. If everyone do, does their job, we gain some yards, and we eventually win, right? On defense, they are much more about passion and adrenaline. They're trying to figure out who has the ball, where is it, what's what's the play, and we've got to get there now and stop what's going on. So we were, before one game, um, our coach was giving us the win one for the Gipper, right, speech. And all of a sudden, the theme music music from Rocky comes out of nowhere. And all the... All, the, all the, the defensive players are just shaking. They're just so pumped full of adrenaline. They're ready to go out and, and kill the other team or whatever it is that Christian colleges that playing football do. You're not supposed to kill them, but you're supposed to really make them regret their choices. Um, and, uh, and, and all of us offensive linemen, we started looking around. We were looking for where the music was coming from. We couldn't figure it out. Where's the music coming from? There's no... So when we got into our little huddle with the offensive line... The first thing everybody said was, where's the music coming from? And one guy said, wow. You know, one of the coaches had it behind his back. He hit something and it started playing. Just different, right? We're just different people. Um, depends on how the coaches wanted to do us. Um, Jesus does the same thing. 
when Mary and Martha come up to Jesus and say, hey, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. What does he do with Mary? He, he weeps with her. And what does he do with Martha? He says, you have to remember who I am, that I'm the resurrection and the life. In other words, you have to get it into your head that I am who I am. And it's never going to be too late. Different sisters, different approach. So we, we need the carrot and we need the stick from time to time. We need encouragement and a hug sometimes. Other times we need to be told to rub some dirt in it. Suck it up, keep going. We need both. The problem is that, that someone who is willing to weep with us doesn't always feel comfortable telling us the truth. And someone who's willing to tell us the truth often can't do it with, with a heart. Um, now, a truth teller that weeps with us, that's really what we need. So who can give that? Well, not me. I'm certainly not perfect. Um, Guys tend to be fixers. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but Kaidi comes to me with a situation at work. She says, here's the situation. And my instinct is to go, well, here's the solution. You need to talk to here, you need to do this, and you need to do that. That's not what she wants. No, she wants to be heard. There we go. And then other people are, are feelers. They, they're so merciful and they're so sympathetic and empathetic that, that they can't give the sterner encouragement to stay where you are, suck it up, and, and just keep going. There is, though, we know from Scripture, a wonderful counselor. Isaiah chapter 6, or rather 9. Jesus is it. He'll give us what we need. And if you want to be a counselor yourself, which we're all called to be priests, right? We have to have our human nature changed and transformed by God's presence. I, have to, I suspect people who are counselors but not followers of Christ can be very, very good at diagnosing an issue but less good at solving it because I think a lot of our issues come about who we are and if we're not settled on who we are in Christ, you're just putting a Band-Aid on, on, a, on a bigger wound. So why is Jesus such a good counselor? Well, verse 15 Jesus can sympathize with us because he was human. He was tempted in every way as we are tempted and yet didn't sin. You know, I used to view teachers uh, the way that my, my friends did. We thought, oh, that'd be great to be a teacher. These little people, they're not strong enough to hurt us. They can't do anything to us. You get every summer off. That's great. And then I um, tried teaching a little. Total respect for teachers now. That, that's a tough job. And Jesus gets that. He wasn't just up in heaven throwing out commandments, saying, hey, I bet you could, you could do this. No, no, he, he comes down and he's actually one of us. He, he gets us. Christianity is unique compared to every other religion in its claim that Jesus, that God, became human. Jesus experienced everything that you will experience or have experienced. I mean, grief, betrayal, sadness, frustration, disappointment, bitterness, suffering, everything. I mean, think about this. A kid living in poverty and that grew up in poverty and is still in poverty kind of gets that life is not as good as it could be, but doesn't really understand how good it could be. But a kid who grew up in a mansion with butlers and pools and fancy cars, if that kid ends up impoverished, he is really gets it because he knows how good life could be. You and I have never been to heaven. We don't know how good it could be connected to God in, in such a close and intimate way, but Jesus has. He was there and then came down here. And so he knows our suffering perhaps better than we do. He can see how spiritually impoverished we are, and he doesn't want that for us. Jesus voluntarily left paradise, but what I think that means is that no one has experienced the depth of rejection like he did. Nobody knows how good it could be but someone who's been there. I mean, and I think because he knows, knew how good experience, existence could be, his time on earth was that much tougher. But at the same time, he was completely without sin. He has experienced all of life as a human, and he did it without sin. Jesus knows our pain better than we do. 
I mean, I think this is why we see Jesus weeping and we see him sighing and we see him praying by himself. We see Jesus' tender heart all through the Gospels. Let the little children come to me. One of my favorite stories is the, is the rich young ruler. And Jesus has to tell him, listen, it is not enough for you to do everything right. It just isn't enough. It never will be. It was never designed to be everything that you do being enough. And, and the, that's what the rich young ruler wants. It says, tell me what I can do to earn eternal life, to, to, to solidify the deal. And Jesus is, loves the man, but he has to tell him, that's not it. You, ha- you have to put God before your money. Um, and, and that was a hard lesson. Or think of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus says to the crowd that wants to kill her, you who are without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone at her. And the men are probably throwing their rocks up in the, in the air and just thinking about it, and then they just drop them and walk away, ashamed. And Jesus says to her, where'd they go? She said, well, they all left. And he said, well, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. You have to see that he wasn't, he was telling her the truth, but he wasn't also enabling her. He could have said, yeah, you know, life's tough, so just keep doing your best. But he doesn't. He could say, well, who knows what sin is really anyway, just, you know, have at it. And he doesn't. He doesn't say, hey, your life is a dumpster fire. Get your act together. This is your last warning. He doesn't. Or even worse, he could say, listen, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of your life. If you ever sin again, I'm not going to love you. And it's actually what happens is the reverse. He says, I want you to base your behavior on my love. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. It's the hatred of the sin and the complete love for and acceptance of the sinner. I will always be amazed at Jesus' love and grace, even especially in my own life. In the Old Testament, when the people were around, there were two very important people in that society. There were the kings and there were the priests. The kings gave the law and they enforced the law given by God. Um, he was, the king was the truth speaker. He was God's representative to the people. And the priests, on the other hand, were the opposite. They were the people who represented the people to God. They were the the ones who collected you in and you confessed your sins and they killed the, the animal and they, and they pronounced that the sacrifice was acceptable to God and now you are reconnected to God through this sacrifice. They're the people who will weep. They're, they're the ones who are going to feel. Um, the kings, you have to picture them as the stern father and the priest kind of as the loving mothers. To have both aspects in one person to have both the law and and the hugs in the same person, that would have been very hard for them to conceptualize. There was one person in the Old Old Testament that used to embody that, and it was a guy named uh, Melchizedek, uh, who wasn't an Israelite. Abraham meets him. He is very briefly mentioned in the Old Testament. He was the king of a city that offered sacrifices to Yahweh. And he wasn't seen much because he's really a foretaste. He's a prototype of what Jesus would later embody. Um, I mean, it's hard to someone to imagine someone who both speaks truth and offers hugs, but that's who Jesus is. And we see this on the cross. God's righteousness is met by this exact right sacrifice. And God's love is that he took our pain and our sin. And so Jesus can say to the woman caught up in adultery, go and sin no more. Because I'm going to take the consequences of your sin. I'll make it okay. You can come to God through me. So, an entire sermon on counseling. I, uh, I hope you're not feeling overwhelmed or insecure. I, I just really wanted to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. I mean, if you're still thinking about following Jesus, it's possible that you could be too proud for counseling and, and you'd never go. Or the other end of the spectrum, you might become too dependent on your therapist. And I don't think that's what God wants either. 
Um, so I think counseling needs to come in a couple of different ways. The first is salvation. We need to be saved. And what I mean is, have you allowed Jesus to become your counselor, the one who's going to speak truth into your life through Scripture, through his word, and give you hugs in prayer also through his word? When we see the cross, I hope you see it as proof that we don't just need a little improvement in our lives, but a complete redo. I mean, think of what Jesus went through in order to not condemn you. Let Jesus love you while he hates and roots out your sin. Second, we all need to be part of a body of believers that we trust enough to hear the truth and who love you enough to tell you the truth. We need to encourage and we need to be encouraged. We need to exhort and be exhorted. We need to counsel and be counseled. People who, because of their inclinations, will collectively tell you the truth and, and help you give, get fixed and, and, and cry with you and feel your pain and, and pray with you. And third is, is we have to just endure. We have to keep going. And I'll explain that. Listen again. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayer and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean he was heard? I mean, he died on the cross, right? That's the story. Jesus asked to be delivered from death, and in a way, he was. Um, God gave him what he asked for, just not in the way that he wanted it. So we who are in the desert also need to endure. God will give you what you need, but sometimes not in the way or the timing that you want. You're just going to have to trust him. Jesus went through the cross for you to be your counselor. So I hope you can trust God with some hard things this week. Maybe you need to give him your child that you're praying for and trust him. Maybe you need to give him the finances you're afraid of and trust him. Maybe you need to give him your past and your present and your future and trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder that, that you have been through everything. There's nothing new under the sun that, that we're going to go through that you haven't experienced first, that you know us and you love us and you want us to succeed for you, for the kingdom for the people around us. So Lord, I ask you, wherever we are, that you'd meet us there. Uh, we're confident that through the Holy Spirit you do that and you exhort us, you encourage us, you counsel us, you keep us going, and we're very grateful. Part of, Lord, what you've asked us to do in response to your presence in our lives is to offer up our sins um, for you to take care of, for you to deal with that uh, when we offer you our sins, we're told that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, we ask that you would listen to these prayers as we come before you. We're reminded, Lord, that you know everything about us. There's nothing hidden from you. So the things that we have said that we ought not to have, things that we have done that we ought not to have, things that we have even thought that we ought not to have, you know those things. And you're just asking, waiting for us to come and confess them so that you can come in and change our lives. And so we do confess those things and ask you to change them. We confess the things that we should have done but failed to do and failed to say um, for whatever reasons, embarrassment or weakness. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to come into our hearts day after day and mold us and shape us through your word to give us hope and a future with you. We're so grateful, Lord, for the cross. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we are graced and forgiven, and God is good. Um, so I can tell you with the full authority of the gospel that you are forgiven. Amen? All right.
So as we take communion, a couple of things. Um, one, there are gluten-free crackers on, on the plates. And so if that's you, go ahead and take, take one. Um, hey, bud. So, Calvin, to remind us that on the day that, that, that Jesus was, was captured, just before he was captured and started that, that day of torture, after celebrating the Passover, Jesus was with the disciples in the upper room. And once they finished the Passover celebration, he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. As I come up, can I get a couple volunteers to help me? And let me remind you that this is not about your goodness. This is not about being Presbyterian. This is about us acknowledging who God is and his sacrifice for us. So eat and, and, and remember. broke the bread and said, take, eat, remember and celebrate. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he poured out the wine. He said, this wine is, is my blood shed for you shed for the forgiveness of sins. It's often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, you celebrate my life until I come again. Hold on to the, hold on to it. Hold on to the grape juice. We'll drink it together.
Jesus said, take, drink, remember, and celebrate. Jesus, thank you for this reminder of how much it costs you to buy our freedom. Help us to live in the knowledge of that love and grace. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we stand for our final song? Today we celebrate Jesus, his life and death and his mercy, and we sing of his mercy in this new song, His Mercy is More. That's okay. He's just giving voice to what many of you, are, I'm sure, are thinking. Oh, Brad, that's good, too. Uh, let's be sent out from here with a blessing. Lord, um, use our lives to, to shine forth your glory into this world. Guide us and comfort us and counsel us through the Holy Spirit with the love of Christ and the power of the Lord God Almighty. Change us and use us 
in this world. And the people of God say, Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.